Hey everyone, welcome to Can't Afford to Record, the YouTube channel where we figure out the art of audio production together. Today, we are catching up with Robert Back from Learn Audio Engineering. Robert started Learn Audio Engineering back in 2016, and his videos have caught the attention of 24,000 subscribers as of this recording. Learn Audio Engineering has a whole range of videos on it, from very quick, short, helpful tip videos that will literally save you hours of headache, to uh, a recent series that Robert's been facilitating when he's interviewing people that have inspired him. We had a really good chat and we come up with different sort of spontaneous questions and notions that we pass back and forth. And for me, that just makes this kind of conversation super fun. Now, don't forget, if the Zoom conference call quality isn't your thing, you can go and listen to a much nicer audio version wherever you get your podcasts from. So with all of that out of the way, Get comfortable, get ready for a really fun conversation between me and Robert Back from Learn Audio Engineering. Enjoy. Cool. We are here with Robert Back from Learn Audio Engineering. How are you Hello. doing, Robert? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me today, Robbie. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I feel like me and you have needed to connect for a while. I think we've both been Definitely. very aware of what each other is doing. And uh, I've been following your YouTube channel for many years now, because I know you started that in 2016, I believe. Yeah. We're going to get into more of that. Um, I also can't wait to hear about your experiences. And I know you, you went to audio school and you've spent a lot of time in a recording studio and you know, I'm I'm sure there's a lot of stuff we can learn from here, but also just to have a good conversation, you know, just to talk Absolutely, about Absolutely, yeah. I mean, yeah. That's what it's all about. So, Something I ask everyone, very first meeting, is um, do you remember a time you couldn't afford to record? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think I think every recording session that you do yourself has some sort of compromise to it, whether it's the amount of inputs you have or the amount of microphones you have. So I remember, you know, being in a garage band with my friends and having an Apogee one and being like, okay, we got to record the drums. So how are we going to do that? Right? Like, let's get it as close to all the drums as possible. And then later on, you find out that that's like a technique. Um, I think Sylvia Massey calls it the crotch mic. Um, but like, you know, that's something that you would do with a whole bunch of other mics as like a flavor. Uh, but when you don't know any better, you're just like, well, I guess I'll use that. Um, so I think like, having like the lack of space or equipment or inputs is definitely something that a lot of home studio engineers can relate with. Even over the summer, Alexa and I did some recording at her dad's place. Um, he has a treated like uh, st studio room and he's got some mics that he's accumulated over the years. He's got some pre's and stuff. Um, and he's a musician himself. So we got to use some of his, uh, his band. Um, so in that, like, you know, just using family or, or, you know, whatever's at our disposal, that was the best kind of outcome for us. Um, but I think, you know, commercial studios aren't always, we have to kind of rethink how we use them sometimes. Like I've had the, the opportunity to record drums in a large space and like, there's no difference, like from recording drums in like a tiny basement to like a huge room with like 16 to 24 inputs. Like, you know, I know which one I would like, but when you can't afford that, you kind of have to get creative. And I think in some way that music has kind of changed. Like we hear a lot more canned sounds and electronic sounds that because those things aren't as accessible, right? So um, there was an interview that I read in 2011 from one of the guys that I interned for him. And he talked about at that time, the decline in, in studio bookings. And he said, what people book the studio for is for drums, right? The big room and for vocals, the coaching between the glass with a, with a producer or something like that, right? Everything else, like if you're thinking about recording guitars, like they have selection of amps, like there's definitely value there. But you know, if you're putting a 57 in front of your, your cabinet this far, there's not much room there, right? So the problems of a small space kind of don't matter in that scenario. So there's things that you can definitely get away with in the small space. And then there's ways that you have to get creative. And I think that's where a lot of the fun is. <laughs> definitely. Um, I think, you know, I think for many of us with, with home studios and home, well, just doing what we do on our channels or what we're always working on, um, I think you're right. I think there's always a point where you want something bigger or better. And I think that's also some of the fun, isn't it, about upgrading. I'm even trying mm -hmm. to, I'm looking at new interfaces on a daily basis. Yeah. And I, I, I kind of want 16 channels now. Or 
I want to be able to record drums, mm-hmm. but yeah, it's, um, I think that's always going to be a thing. However, all of this is so much more accessible now than it was perhaps in 1995 or something yeah. like that, where like yeah. you either, you either did it on like a port, you know, a Tascam Porter studio <laughs> yeah. and hoped for the best, yeah. uh, or you, or you just spent the money. You went into a big, big recording mm-hmm. studio. Yeah. So I think perhaps that question, like, do you remember a time when you couldn't afford to record has, has maybe always been there and always been yeah. there. It always will be. Yeah. yeah. In some way or another, you got to make, make do with the best of what you can. Yeah. Do you think that pushes you? Um, and yes. gets you better i think it does because especially as i've trained my ear especially after you've heard that standard like when you hear yourself recorded through a knee or something like that and you're like yeah and then you go back and you and you're like i'm gonna move the mic or something right i'm gonna get there and you might get there with a bit of eq you might tweak your amp right but i, I think once you get that sound you chase it you know what i mean and like people can get good sounds with a 2i2 right but you've got to be stubborn and you got to like it's in there and i'm going to figure out how to use my amp i'm going to figure out where to place the mic you know i'm going to read some interviews see what uh, like you know my favorite uh, engineers did but you're going to get there and i think just being stubborn about it <laughs> and getting the sound that you want and not settling um is really important especially early on because when you only have a couple pieces of equipment you have to know them really well or else it's really easy to just fall into the, oh, I want the next thing. And I want, I want that because then I can buy those analog model plugins or something, right? Like, Do you think then in that case, it's like almost as much as like we strive for the Neve sound or, you know, or the SSL sound or, or whatever it might be. Do you think then in a way, by getting to that stage too quickly, you kind of just take it that it's good. Like, you would probably, you know, I just wonder if, like, if we plug into, you know, your, your guitar or your vocals are going through a Neve or something like that, then you might just be even more, um, you might just accept that that's the sound quicker and be like, well, it's, you know, a five grand preamp. So, yeah, that's probably, we're probably good to go. Where actually you could still move that mic a little bit more. Mm-hmm. I, I find know. that, I found that in my internship, um, it, that, you know, when I would get mixing lessons at the end of the day, it was like, these are moggy cues. If you boost that 20, it like, it does cool stuff, write that down. Okay. Or like, uh, you know, Neves are really good on bass, write that down. It's, it's sort of like at a point is it like, it's just buying stuff and using that. It's like, you know, it's, it, it seems less about the technique and the art for sure. And more just like have great stuff. Mm-hmm. And that because I'm using great stuff, that's good. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, maybe it does let you get a little lazy with it, but um, yeah. I think it, it's also a little revealing. Like some of these preamps, like I've listened to it right away and I've been like, like, I don't like that. Like I need to, you know, different microphone or, or something that maybe it's just revealing something in, in some way. Yeah. Um, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about how you got your first internship. That is something that it seems mm. extremely hard to do. I mean, I feel like I have seen countless Reddit threads of like, how do mm-hmm. I get my first internship at a studio? Or how do I do this? And how did you do that? Because um, that just isn't accessible for so many people. I would agree that it's not very accessible and I'm not sure where it would, it would really end up, but I, I just applied for it. Like, um, we had booked a session at a, at a local studio. And when we went in there, I just expressed to the engineer after the session that I was interested in recording. I gave him a business card and I was like, you know, I'll come here at 7 a.m. if you want. And he's like, you know, we start at 10, like relax. Um, and he, he did give me an email and he said, um, you know, do you want to start your internship? It was a 200 hour internship. I think I did two of them. And a lot of it, is like, you know, wax on, wax off. It's it, cleaning the studio, um, helping out on sessions, making coffee, kind of just making sure that the session goes as smooth as possible. It, it's, I wouldn't call it a rude awakening, but it's definitely not what you first expect. And we definitely did like ear training exercises. We compared, we put like 20 mics on like, you know, a kick drum and then listened to them all and tried to like hear the difference or, you know, the difference between two pre's or something. And at first it's very difficult because you're like, 
I, th I think I heard something play it again. Like, you know, but um, slowly, I guess you train your ears, but a lot of it was just learning how to set up mics in different, in different ways, getting to work with producers, which I found was the most value is like how people approach things. Um, it's also a place to kind of sh shut your mouth and learn. It's not a place to be like, Hey, I think we should do this. Right. Cause you're, you're not the one paying for the session and the artist didn't hire you. Um, that's kind of one of the, the most important takeaways from that. But if you shut your mouth and you listen, you will learn a lot. And everyone has a completely different way of working and, and finding sounds. And I got to work with a lot of really cool people. Unfortunately, it, in my experience, it does dry up and it kind of gets to the point where like, hey, this is great, but we can't actually hire you here unless you're bringing in sessions. So if you, know, you go to university and you bring all your friends' bands in, Maybe we can do something and you can work on those sessions, but um, yeah. So, um, I mean, do you think it's something that uh, people that are really interested in breaking into the industry need to do? I'm not sure. I don't think that it is. I think that it's an experience. And I think that a lot of people want that experience, just like being in a rock band, we wanted to record an album and we wanted to record an album in a studio and have that experience. I think a lot of that does translate to home recording, but I was kind of left wondering, like, do I need to get an SSL console in my basement in order to run a recording studio then? And this is a bit of my critique. I, I'd, I'd really appreciate some perspective on this, but it's a bit of my critique about recording education is when people learn on a huge a API and then they go home with their Scarlet, they're sort of like, you know, something's missing. Maybe I need to get something else before I can really work. And that might not be everybody, right? But um, it leads people to, or it might lead people to kind of a gear lust that they, they always need more and what they have isn't enough. Um, yeah, I think that is a huge conversation topic, isn't it? I mean, how many times have I can only guess you've been in the same place as me where it's like, I can literally not do this without this piece of equipment now. Like you get you do put yourself yeah. into that mindset. Yeah. Where you're like, well, I may as well give up. If I it's great to have that gear. There's nothing wrong with it. But it's like, if you don't have it, do you have to seek it out? Well, I think I try and do my best to always relate it back to the guitar i'm a guitarist first and foremost and teach a lot of guitar and i've played in uh, more bands than i care to admit um and does a 99 dollar guitar play different notes to a 1500 dollar guitar we see slash has that les paul does that mean that are we going to play like slash if we have that les paul of course not and I think that's the sort of things I'm trying to, I have to sort of check myself with, like, hold yeah. on a second. Like, yeah, I would absolutely love that Neumann microphone, but like, is it going to do the whole job for me or is it going to just do a little bit of the job for me? So yeah. I do believe a good playing guitar. I do I've, believe I've... if you spend more on a good guitar, you will get a better playing experience yeah. maybe, but... I'm not, you know, it also doesn't play the scales or the guitar solos for you. Yeah. I've heard that there's, there's five things that, that make up the sound and, and in order of importance, there's the player, there's the instrument, there's the room, there's the microphone, there's the preamp, right? So the, the most important is the player and what they play. Eddie Van Halen, Jimmy Page with a $90 guitar is going to sound wicked. It doesn't matter. Um, right? So... The first two, as long as you've got a great player, the instrument, not so much, but you know, usually when you get to that caliber, you're going to have a great instrument. Um, the room, I think matters. That's going to play a variable. And then to some degree, the microphone and the preamp that you use, but most importantly, the player, you know, and then the instrument and then, and then things like that. Um, and so I'm reminded of that so much um, in the interviews that I've done of this, this series, this local leaders thing, at the end of every interview, we ask them some form of like, you know, what's the secret? What's the secret to mixing or recording? And a lot of them are just like, oh, just get good players. Like, you just get good players. You, you play it right. You don't need to do anything. <laughs> it almost feels like a, like a cheat answer, but it's so true. 
yeah I, and that's something that's actually come uh become quite apparent to me lately is i've been sort of working on some uh, mixes for some friends and i've you know really started pushing myself as someone that yeah you know i i'm i'm opening up opportunities for myself to be a mixing engineer and to start working and collaborating in that way which is you know what my whole channel and my whole sort of latest venture is all about mm -hmm. and i have realized like and this is sort of moving away from it now but hey you know what that acoustic guitar was tracked really well and maybe i don't need to eq it and mm -hmm. uh but every every youtube video i've watched has told me i need to eq it so what so it's when you have a net, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. When when you have the nice Fab Filter plugins, well, I gotta use this, and I gotta I put have, it on oversample. I spent one hundred and seventy dollars on this plugin. Why wouldn't I use it? Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's amazing. It's amazing how like yeah how how much, um, how much that stuff inspires us, rightly or wrongly. Mm. Um, I don't know. That's a it's a real tough one. Um, I I've been speaking with a really good friend. Uh, lately where I was like tell me more about mix templates and like sh how should I sort of how should I adjust mine and this is someone I really really respect works on really good records back in the UK uh, they get great radio play and he, he's definitely a go-to guy and he was like well actually I've the latest sessions I've been doing I've been starting with a blank template I don't I just load the audio tracks in and use what I use and I was like, wait, are you, wait, really? Like, you don't have everything there ready to go? Like, that's what I've <laughs> everything listened to on everything. Yeah. 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 You're like, no, no, I've just started. I just got rid of my template and I just start from fresh every time now. And I was like, huh, what a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to do now as well. Yeah. But we'll, we'll see how it goes. You got to, you know, periodically stop and rethink what you're doing. There's a saying that I love, um, what got you here won't get you there. Oh, um, like for a lot of the stuff that I've done, like even in YouTube, like when I started, I was like, I'm going to do a video a week. I'm going to build that audience. And then it was like, stop and like, think what's working. Um, see what's working with other channels in your niche and like copy that and do it better. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. give one more tip or, or give your own view on it or something like that. Um, but constantly reassess your your method of action and the way that you're going about things because otherwise it's just kind of insanity you're trying the same thing and if it's not working you're not going to get a different result so so let's move into that youtube world because that's cool. how i discovered you mm -hmm. i um i i think i saw so either either you posted it was on reddit or yeah. someone posted it on reddit yeah. and i was like oh this sounds like a cool channel and I watch a bunch of videos I instantly subscribed. Um, and I think it was pretty, I mean, dude, I think I was like 2016 or 17, you were a pretty wow. young channel. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I look today and you've got 24,000 subscribers. Yeah. Um, tell me all about that. And you know, is that something you feel really proud about? Is it something you don't really care about very much? <laughs> what's the, what's the, What's the reason for doing the it, YouTube channel, which is great, by the way? The the reason for doing the YouTube channel was to build an audience for my own personal brand or business. Like I started Learn Audio Engineering. I was learning to be a recording engineer, a mixing engineer, and I wanted to share those skills with people, teaching how to do that. And also just, hey, you know, I'm here, I'm for hire, hire me to mix your sessions. And I started with blog posts and, you know, I'm a little stiff at writing. So I, I decided to go into video. Um, I kind of did it continuously. I've read a lot of books on like business and marketing and stuff, which has kind of given me um, a leg up, I guess. But I, I guess the big thing is just consistency and knowing your your market, like learning from people like you and, and talking to other people that work in home studios, what struggles they're having, what they want. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know exactly what's made it grow, but uh, I'm really grateful for it. It's kind of hard to fathom 24,000 people following something you're doing. So I try not to think about it a lot, but I try and think of it as like a responsibility, you know, to to put out good content and to deliver to those people that, that subscribe, you know? As somebody that, you know, um, you know, I, I, I think I, I've, I think everyone that starts a YouTube channel gets into the same uh, YouTube world clock where it's like 
oh dude like i gotta get this video out monday at 10 a.m to my 58 subscribers i have to do it um yes. but and i eventually found it as much as you know I eventually found it exhausting and I was starting to not actually enjoy what I was producing yeah. or editing or yeah. just like it felt like a job. And that was never the idea mm -hmm. of, of can't afford to record. I feel like I actually managed to catch it just before I got to that stage. And it was like sure. a promise that I sort of made to myself right at the beginning of like, I'm just going to show stuff when I'm doing it. And it should and feel when exciting. I'm inspired to. And when I feel yeah. excited or when I get yeah. a preamp or when I yeah. want like i'm just gonna do it then that was the whole idea about it but it's really easy to fall into that into that yeah. sort of uh rabbit hole of like i have to do this i've got to get it done i think yeah. though it that is needed to get <laughs> twenty four thousand yeah. subscribers like i've been in that rat race kind of this whole season since the summer working on this series um from the filming and now leaving the editing it's been a lot and having to put out like a 15 to 20 minute a week is no joke and i can only the people that do it daily it's like you have to have a team at that yeah. point. Like it's super human and there's so much going on behind the scenes that if you can get there and if you can have like an editor or something like awesome, I'm not there yet one day, but, um, I, the ideas that I have coming next, I'm excited about, like, I'm really like, I've been thinking about them for a while and I'm like, I need to get this done so I can get on that. And that excites me. The fact that I'm excited excites me and it makes me want to work again thinking about the YouTube algorithm and like, oh, should I do this or this? Or should I release it on Wednesday? Or, you know, that just makes me not want to do this. Mm -hmm. And that's not what it's about. Um, I, yeah. I would just say anyone who's looking to get into this, it might be worthwhile to do that for a while, but like set a reminder, like one year, two years in your phone, to like chill out and to rethink things because um, it's really worthwhile to do that. At least I think, me. I think you're right. I think, um, you know, when you first get started, you want to be excited. You want to make lots of content. I did the same thing. I did one video and one podcast interview every single week, I think it was. And I just cr just crushed and crushed, which got me 50 or so videos onto my channel pretty quickly. And I yep. think gives people a reason to subscribe. Mm -hmm. Yes. I haven't watched all these 50 videos yet. I think I'd quite like to subscribe. That's mm. kind of what I think the mindset is. Um, it's hard to get people to su subscribe when you've only got two videos, maybe, or just one yeah. video. So I yeah. think there is a certain... And I think you have to... Because um, as you say, there are people that do this every single day and obviously get such a thrill out of it. Like, they, mm. they, love, the, they love the hustle of the YouTube algorithm. Mm. And, um, you know, there's something to be said for that. But yeah, I think if you're not careful, you can fall that. Okay, the, the, the... the last thing that I'll say on that is, yeah. is the difference between someone with an audience and someone without an audience. Mm -hmm. If you are someone who is like a YouTuber and you have an audience and we see so much ridiculous stuff, so much like random stuff on you, they're like, why would that ever exist? People know their audience. They know that they will watch this stuff. And if you go in there and you're like, I guess I should just post this random whatever, it's not going to work because you don't have that connection with those people that want that thing. So you have to approach content differently. What I did is I approached things that people would be searching for, what they call evergreen content. Yeah. Um, things that people are like, well, how do I do that? How do I change my oil? You know, things like that, that are, you know, they're, they're basically a commodity. Anyone who has done that can be an expert on it and, and can share that, right? Mm -hmm. And like, that's not the only thing I did, but that would be my advice to people is, is build an audience, like, you know, figure out who you want to, who you want to attach yourself to and what they're going to be searching for till the end of time, do that. And then when you have them talk to them and figure out what they actually want. Yeah. What you can build for them. Yeah. Yeah. And you've also done it in a really clever way as well. I think where it's not you in every video, um, you have guests coming in, you have people speaking, you have, um, you know, as I, as I know, you've sort of said before, like, I'm going to have a professional singer talk about recording yeah. vocals here. Um, that's a really, really valuable thing to give to an audience, I think. I, well, I thought, you know, I'm not the expert on everything. <laughs> and but when you admit that to yourself, so many doors open. Like yes. I can provide value to so many people, people that, you know, are, are experts and would never be able to, to share that. They don't have an audience, right? You can connect that or you can build their audience. Um, so I like, I think, there's there's so much collaboration that can go on with this 
um I, I learned that from watching you to be honest like from the interviews I don't I don't know what it was but I watched you and like and I was like how does he know all these people and I, I just I, I had the thought of like they're an expert in this thing that you might not be an expert on but you had them and then you're and I was just like why don't I do that and like yeah. honestly so yo props dude <laughs> oh dude thanks so much I appreciate that yeah I mean I think there's, that's um yeah, I think you I think you got it right there is like, you know, I'm we don't all I think when you're trying to do a YouTube channel or a podcast or something like that, you do you give yourself a responsibility of I have to deliver absolutely everything. I have, I have to be totally authoritative. I am yeah. the guy, yeah, or yeah. I I am whoever <laughs> and and I've got to know all this stuff. But no one does and it's uh, absurd to ever think that and I think yeah, like tell me about you know mastering tell me about what it was like to record in this studio for the day mm -hmm. like how how should people do this how should and i think yeah if and the, i've learned honestly so much from those interviews and uh, the great thing about doing interviews um and what i'm looking forward to doing with yours as well is editing uh just so anyone if anyone's listening or watching it's 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 a lot of work. We go back and I make sure all the mics are on the right levels. It means I hear yeah. a lot of sentences and uh, explanations over and over, yeah. hundreds of times, but it goes in. It gets stuck. Yep. It gets yep. stuck. It really, really does. And um, and that's when, so that's when I really learn the most from the interviews is when I, 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 I find the exact same thing. Like I, I, it happens and I'm so in the moment that I'm like, I'm listening, but I'm not really processing. But then you go back and you edit, you're like, that was a good answer. Yeah. Um, something I'll share, one of the quotes from the, I got to interview the head of recording at the, the university that I went to. Yes. And just in the middle of the interview, he drops the most important skill in the music industry is the ability to stay employed. And I was like, you should tell that to every first year who comes into this program. Yeah. Because I, I, I kind of get the sense that, and he, he said it, you know, they're going to need to take the skills that they learn and, and a skill on its own won't get you anywhere, but you need to use all these skills in combination to, to create something new and exciting. Right. Um, one of my other, like the, one of my other teachers said, it was kind of like being a, a washing machine dial. If you're a washing machine on one setting, you're not very useful, but the more that you can, like you're a guitar player. Great. Can you sing? Can you record yourself? Can you edit those recordings? Can you mix those edited recordings? Can you, know, can you market those to an audience? Like all of these things are different jobs. And like the stuff that I'm doing today is not the stuff that I learned in university. And I think that's so cool, but it's also kind of a rude awakening when you're like, you know, I have to do more than just play the guitar here, <laughs> you know? And, and that's what I was taught to do. Like, yikes <laughs> yeah i th i um, think yeah. you i love that analogy the 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 what, what was it was it a, it was a washing, machine, washing, machine? washing machine washing <laughs> machine dial yeah, yeah. <laughs> dishwasher yeah washing machine dial yeah that is such a good point because mm. um which is why i started all this i've always loved recording but i was like when the pandemic hit i was like all right well i'm not waiting around i'm gonna <laughs> i'm gonna learn how to do this because yeah. By the time this is all over one day, I want this to be another avenue of income because yes. yeah. I want to carry on being a musician, yeah. you know, um, and for anyone else listening out there, if you play guitar and you want to join a band, start learning how to sing or be able to do backing vocals because uh, people will want you in their band if you can do that. <laughs> Learn to play drums. You'll be able yeah. to communicate with the drummer. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, um, yeah. Yeah, just I've just had learning. my, by the way, if anyone's listening at home, uh, I'm sure there are, but I've just had a cat come in and so it could get noisy. <laughs> I've got a very vocal cat, but um, he's a little pitchy. So apologies in advance. Um, I, a, a friend of mine once, uh, I, I loved what they said. Um, <laughs> well, there you go. That's the first, that's there the first meow. Um, a friend of mine said, you know, we're not trying to be guitarists. We're trying to be musicians. Mm -hmm. And I like, I really like that, you know, yeah, why, why can't you play drums? Why can't you play bass? Why can't you uh, take a back seat from the guitar? You know, I think for the longest time I was like, I've, I'm a guitarist and nothing else. I don't want to play bass. I don't ever want to play drums in a band. But yeah, if you can actually do a little bit of this and a little bit of that, you really do build up a lot of skills and people like that. The, the other thing I'd say, just as a guitar player myself, you play too many notes. 
you, you don't have to breathe to play. So you just, you feel everything. Like I've, um, when I was a teacher and we do like, you know, coaching sessions with bands and the guitar player just hits that stomp box is like way louder than everyone else. And it's just way up the neck. Um, and I remember saying to him like, you know, how many guitar solos do you hear on the radio nowadays? Like, mm. you know what I mean? Like there, there's a time and a place for everything, but the, it's, it's kind of like, you know, nobody wants to hear a 32 bar solo in pop music. Like, so, you know, pick your avenue. Like, I, I'm not gonna, like, I'm a guitar player. I love that shit. But it's like, I've had to be like, you know what? Maybe I've got to make like a really syncopated, like three note catchy thing that, that will like get stuck in your head versus like showing off. Yeah. Because again, I'm not a guitar player. It's not an ego thing. It's about the music. Another like thing that I've heard is like, the, if you listen to music, you, you imagine that the artist can play anything and they only choose to play this what they put in front of you because that's what works for the song um yeah yeah i i i have a question um that just popped into my head as someone that yeah. has been an intern at a recording studio has interviewed all these people i presume uh maybe wrongly that the recording studio you interned in was using pro tools as a daw mm -hmm. but i know you're a logic pro guy um so I wondered why that maybe you that hadn't been adopted. Um, Pro Tools is really expensive, and I think now it's a thousand dollars a year. I think we finished. I think that I think you got it done. So yeah. <laughs> I love Pro Tools when it works. It's mm. great when it works. Mm. Um, it I I have found it to be one of the most unstable pieces of software I've ever used. The things that can like, I love it. And like, when I worked in a studio, I got so good at key commands. I didn't have to touch the mouse at all. Like I could do playlists, I could do all sorts of stuff. Um, and I got really good at it. And I still have like versions of Pro Tools and I have sessions in Pro Tools. I still like using it, but it always like with the eye lock and like it crashes and like the perpetual license and everything. It's just, they make it kind of hard to use. And I understand that, you know, maybe they really do want to be seen like for the top, for the top ends of studios. And like, if you can't afford it, well, I guess you, I don't know, maybe that's what it is. Logic, I love because it's kind of a blend between MIDI and audio. The workflow for both is really great. I, I was even doing something in Pro Tools yesterday using MIDI and I was like, oh, I guess you can like do MIDI in Pro Tools. I'm not really great at it and it feels a little clunky to me, but you can do it. You can but do Logic, it, but it it doesn't yeah. hold a flame to logic does logic it? with the drummer like logic drummer is so powerful the loops um just it's a great software i've used it since like garage band that was the first thing that i learned on and i still use logic today i was just i'm i'm working with a, a client right now and they want to get a drum part down and so i just open up logic and i put on that drummer i moved things around i added fills i did this send it back and said is this what we're going to send to the actual drummer like this is kind of what i programmed does this feel good yeah that feels good okay they were good you know and and send it off it's so easy yeah. saying that i did move to pro tools recently <laughs> <laughs> and i moved because i thought i needed to maybe this is a whole different podcast really because they could this alone could go on for hours but I switched to it because I felt like I needed to. The other thing I switched to, uh, or reason I switched to Pro Tools, is because I would find that I'd be following people on YouTube, rightly or wrongly. Um, they all used Pro Tools. And I kind of felt like Logic does so much of the moves for you and, and, and gives you the auxes and does all that stuff set up for you. And I kind of felt like... Yeah. Yeah. That is a great thing, but I also would like to learn the routing on that and why did it do this and how do I set it up for this? That's a really fair criticism, actually. I made a video on how to delete a bus in Logic because that needs to exist yeah. because it's not intuitive. Yeah. And it, every time you create a bus like or a, like a reverb center or something and it has like all these plugins loaded on it, it's like, you're like, I don't want any of that. So yes, that is very valid. Pro Tools, I feel, is a blank slate and I can make it do exactly what I want it to do. Yeah, yeah. And in that regard, it's great. It's great. Yeah, I, I, and I think when I sort of really reflect now, did I need to move to Pro Tools? No, I'm doing the subscription thing. I'm doing the thing cool. everybody cool. hates, but yeah. um, I feel like I like the look of Pro Tools. Like I feel, it feels- You feel good using it. It feels good <laughs> using it. Yeah. And I do find myself like I'm moving. Yeah, I, I don't know what it is. I feel like my mixes have improved. That being said, I don't know if they really have, 
But then again, <laughs> listen to all these contradictions. Yeah. Is there anything wrong with thinking that my mixes are better because of it? Because maybe that's... If you feel more confident, right? Maybe it's a placebo effect. I don't know. Maybe that's what we're paying for, Rob. We're <laughs> paying for the placebo effect of Pro yeah. Tools. Might be. Yeah. Um, a few more questions then. Sure. Um, yeah. So when it comes to mixing... Um, how do you you know do you have a process when you're mixing a song for someone um because we can all spend agonizing hours uh we go to bed still listening to the mix that we just did um you know final dot 17 dot final mix dot finished mix dot whatever we <laughs> want to call it yeah, yeah yeah how do you how do you turn off how do you say no okay you know what I'm, this is what i'm gonna send I think a deadline is the most important thing. I'm going to say that right away. Um, like in terms of like a mixing process, uh, like I would start at the busiest, most com complicated section, like the chorus and kind of like, you know, balance from there. Like I always start with volume balance. A lot of the stuff that I do first is just like removing things that I feel are like extra uh, and turning stuff down because usually when you get stuff, it's way too loud and it's it's peaking the limiter and you're going to want, or it's peaking the the master fader. Yeah. And you're, you're going to want a lot of extra headroom. But um, like you'd kind of set a couple couple things like when is a mix done? Or that was one of your, your questions yeah. you said. Or sorry, what was the question again? Can you... So th the question is like, what is your process of like, um, I guess not spending- Not spending forever on a mix? Forever on something. Um, the deadline is, is definitely something using a notebook when you mix really helps um, and taking breaks. Like if I'm going to mix something, I'm probably going to spend max like four hours on it and then I'm going to take a break. Um, two hours if I'm if I'm really lucky and I can I can spend the time. So like I would spend two hours just kind of like playing with the levels and everything in mono, just trying to get everything to like sound like a song. Um, and then take a break and come back and write down everything that you hate. Um, one of the things that really causes you to chase your tail is because music is, is through time, right? If we decide at this point, this is too loud and we turn it down, it affects everything, right? But if you go in and you're like, oh, I'm gonna automate it right away, it locks your fader. If, if you do like the fader automate, like, you know, there's yes. ways you can automate a gain plugin. But um, so, you know, I just try and, uh, I guess, yeah, listen through the song and write down what you hear and then think about how am I gonna solve those things. Um, trying to, you know, do the creative parts and the, the analytical parts separately, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so there's times when I'll just, you know, I'll balance and I'll get everything where I want it to be. And then there's times when I'll listen back and I'll, I'll try and be like, hey, what's wrong with it? What's sticking out? And the more that you do that, the more that analytical brain starts to shut off because you, your toe starts tapping, your head starts bobbing. And you're like, okay, this starts to sound like music. I like it. I'm not analyzing it anymore. I'm starting to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And that's when you know you're on the right path. Um, so if you can keep listening through the song, making notes of, of little things and going in and, and tweaking them, that's when you start to do the little automations and things. Again, my tip would be to use a gain plugin so that if, you know, you there's something loud that needs to come up or, or whatever, you can still kind of tweak that fader a little bit if you need to do a macro thing. But like, ultimately it's a deadline. You have to say to yourself, I'm gonna release this in two weeks or I'm gonna give myself a week to mix it because it can be done. But you know, when you're on the studio and you're, and you're paying and you're on the clock, you're gonna get it done. But when you're at home and you know, I, I got a coffee and I'm comfy and maybe I'll tweak a little bit more. Maybe I'll see how I feel in the morning. The mix is never going to get done. No. Um, and you were talking like um, you were talking about uh, songs that have mixes that are kind of weird. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just I'll just segue. Yeah, segue into, into that because I love that question. Like, what's a Be weird, what's a great song, but is a terrible mix or a weird mix or whatever? I, I take it back to the blues because I think mm -hmm. of like you know the, the recording format for the time. Like, I love those recordings. I remember really getting into like the British rock and stuff, Led Zeppelin, The Stones. And when my dad heard me listening to that, he's like, "Oh, that's a Willie Dixon song. Like that that's from the '30s or something." I'm like, what? Like, and I go back and I listen to Robert Johnson and stuff, and you're like 
this sounds like crap, but it's amazing. You know, you know what I mean? And now like, uh, I think there was a Sun House song I was listening to and then Cage the Elephant, like the slide guitar, uh, No Rest for the Wicked. It's basically the same aesthetic and the same like lo-fi old style, but then they put new elements over it and it creates contrast. Mm. It's kind of used in a, in a different way. So um, other things like, the early Beatles stuff, the weird panning that they would do. Hard a lot right of it, on drums. <laughs> it's like if you if you share an earbud with your friend and you're both listening to a different song, basically, because the drums are over here, the vocals mm-hmm. are over here. Um, one of the, the interviews that I did, we got to go and check out the Rolling Stones mobile studio. I did a two-part series on yes. that. And I was going back and I was listening to a lot of the albums that were recorded through there. There's a Neil Young album, the Harvest one with like Old Man and Heart of Gold. Mm-hmm. The snare is panned left. I don't think the kit is panned left, but the snare is, and it's it just. But but it's you know what that was the that was like that's <laughs> that sounds cool. Let's do that, you guys. Like I listen it to it on my phone, or if I'm not really <laughs> listening, like, and I don't care. I don't notice yeah. it. But when I listen to it on headphones, I'm like, why is it over there? You know what I mean? Mm. So it, it it kind of it at, at times it like it kind of raises an eyebrow, but it doesn't change that I I still like the song right? It doesn't really matter. And with a lot of these, like, you know, where do I place things in the stereo field and all that, most music is listened to outside of the stereo field, unless you're listening on headphones, right? Like people, you know, you have your music on in the corner. So you're not getting the true, it doesn't really matter. Like you go into a grocery store, all that's listened to in mono. Like, that's, that's not, kind of that's, that's a good point yeah that's I, I one think of my the vibe of of and the genre as well right like mm. i think of like man i think if those i wonder if those you know misfits recordings were, had been pristine would they have they wouldn't be the same band you know well it, it, it's really not like there no. was again in the rolling stones there's you can hear them hitting the stomp box or something for satisfaction to kick on the effect like we would edit that out we, we would like, you know, take it and fade it. But that's something that just exists because it's just part of the performance, right? They didn't, whatever, you know, you're you going to go in there with a razor blade and cut that out of the tape. It, it was just, it was not an issue. But now that we can do it, it's like expected that we do it, mm-hmm. that we edit out breaths of a singer's voice or everything so that everything's pristine. And it's, yeah. It's just different. I don't know. It's just different. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So what's coming up? Um, what can we expect on uh Learn Audio Engineering? By the way, everyone who's listening to this, watching this, please go and subscribe to this channel because it is such a wonderful channel and um Robert does such an amazing job explaining stuff. I learn stuff from it all the time. I always watch the videos. Um, but what's coming up next? Because I know you have a new series that you're working yeah. on. All so the time. we're we've got Two more videos coming out. We got another interview with Arnell. He's a studio owner in the Edmonton area. The series that I'm working on, it's about how the recording studio is changing and how that has made changes to the industry. And I interviewed four local leaders throughout Western Canada. Uh, So Dave Thomas, who is the creator of Advanced Audio Microphones. He takes vintage uh, tube microphone designs and uses modern components to make them more consistent. Um, and, and with greater headroom and stuff like that. We went to the Rolling Stones mobile studio. We talked with Jason Talkin, who is the electronics engineer there. He talked about the history of the bus and the future of the bus and why it still holds up in today's day and age of, of digital recording. Um, I got to talk to Paul Johnston, who is the head of recording at McEwen University. He was my teacher. And, um, and then Arnell, who's a, who's a studio owner in the area. Um, I've also been talking with a lot of people in my audience, like like Robbie and, and a few others, and I've been interviewing them and, and and kind of talking about what I've learned on this and getting their insight on it because I really feel that it's like it's you guys that are starting to record, starting to podcast and to create stuff in your bedrooms that is changing the industry. And I want to hear from you because you know I want to know if I'm on the right track. I want to know what I'm missing. Um, so there's going to be a video about that, about kind of my conclusions and, and what I've learned from um, talking with my audience. On top of that, um, I have kind of a series about pop music investigation where I talk about tropes in the pop music industry. And I'm going to do another one about how music has changed since the Beatles to the Max Martin era of like, you know, mega uh, songwriting hits. Um, and then specifically, I want to do something on the mix engineer Zurban Guinea. I don't know if many people know about him, but he mixed every one of Max Martin's songs. He's essentially his mix engineer. If you look him up, he's mixed everything. 
He has 191 number one hits, way more than anyone else. This is all one person. He's a Canadian immigrant who lives in Virginia Beach in the United States. Uh, he, he was trained in Montreal at McGill the same year as, as Paul Johnston, and they don't know each other. And I'm wow. like, it, it, it's wild how much this guy has done. And I want to kind of talk about his style and the, the, the impact that he's had. I want to do more just about individual people that have inspired me and just kind of their, their style of mixing. And I got a lot of ideas. Um, it's just kind of like finding a pipeline of getting them all out and done. And, I yeah. think, uh, you know, if you still haven't uh, opened up your browser, gone over to the YouTube channel by now after that, uh, after that amazing pitch, uh, then come on, go go ahead and subscribe to Learn Audio Engineering. It's well, a thank great you channel. Very much, and you've got a lot of stuff, cool stuff coming out. Yeah. Um, and, you know, your enthusiasm is contagious. Like, thank you, you know, I'm thinking, now, oh, OK, OK, I need to start <laughs> picking it up again now. I need to head over and start a new series and you know um it's just been so great to speak to you and uh Thank just bounce much. off all these ideas with you know with what awesome, you're Robbie. doing and so, this has been such a fantastic podcast and like thank, thank you so you, much man. for having me on i really yeah absolutely it. and you know why not we can do a part two i think we yeah, should absolutely you know, 2022 I'd love to baby yeah you know, that, that's what we'll have to do but thanks yeah. for being on rob i yeah, really absolutely. really appreciate it take good care and uh no absolutely. doubt we will collab in another way sometime <laughs> again very soon awesome okay Thanks, Robbie. Bye-bye.